I was born in Mahia, Texas, M-E-X-I-A, in a little town. My father had a department store there, a dry goods store, and he followed the oil towns. He loved being in an oil town. He always invested in oil wells. He had pie-in-the-sky dreams. My father was an amateur boxer. He came to this country as a 90-pound weakling and he had to build himself up because he was the victim of everybody who picked on him. My dad lived on and on. My dad lived till he was 94. My dad exercised every day of his life. My mother was a pioneer woman. She grew up in New York. And she married my father and he immediately took her to this little town in Texas. And she tells me the story that at the time that I was being born and a little girl, there was no running water in Mahaya. The water truck came by every day and you got the water off the truck. I was the oldest child and I couldn't understand after having me why they'd want another child in this world. They had me. But sure enough, two years after I was born, my brother Jerry came along. And two years later, my sister Roselle came along. We sat around the dinner table and my mother would sing and we'd all sing. And when my mother did a Passover and all the people came for Passover, all the singing went on and on and on and on. It was just a joyous kind of family. Whenever Passover came, Mama opened her house to every Jew in the area and Mama prepared a meal for like a Passover for a king. Gefilte fish is a marvelous day. When I declare Gefilte fish day, my nieces come and sometimes nephews come and my daughters and daughters-in-law come. I hope if, if I give them the recipe, they can continue it after I'm gone. My earliest memories are gathering all the kids in the neighborhood and cleaning out the garage and putting on plays. I would love to have become an actress. My father said, fair, bums are actresses. I was grossly discouraged. And I can't put the whole blame on my father. I could have pressed forward if I had the courage. My father had this old Willis Knight car, I'll never forget it. And on beautiful, sunny Sundays, he would pile us all in. Mama would make a picnic lunch, and we'd drive, I think, 30 or 40 miles to the beach. My father would grab the hands of all the children, and we'd walk toward the ocean, and my mother would stand here and yell, Irving, the children, watch the children. And so we wanted to do it. We were living in Fort Worth, Texas. I had finished a year at Texas Christian University. It was an adjunct to my high school. And uh, my folks decided to move to California. So I applied to Berkeley and was accepted. My roommate and I became very, very friendly. And uh, we're still good friends. And we both transferred to UCLA. And we were having lunch on campus one day. We, frequently met for lunch. And she said, I'm going with this really nice guy. I said, that's wonderful, Suzanne. She said, he has a friend. I said, yeah, what's he like? She says, I don't know, but he dances a terrific rumba. <laughs> I said, okay, I'll meet him. <laughs> so on the basis of dancing a terrific rumba, I met my husband. My husband was a man who lived life on the top of his lungs. He had been working for manufacturers. He understood the garment industry. He had been a buyer for many years. And he decided he wanted to go into business himself. So we gathered together this money, and he started a five machine factory. And it just became the thrust of his life. It was his baby. He loved it. He couldn't wait to wake up in the morning. He really was one of the very early ones who coordinated a sweater with a, pa a pant or a skirt, the same color. So his idea was to bring it in at a price. 
The firm was called Campus Casuals of California, and it was a working girl's price. They could all afford it. So he would take fabric from this country, unusual colors. We'd go to Asia, and there we would have the sweaters made. He found factories there that would make the sweater identical to the color of the skirts and pants that we made. Without a doubt, the most important influential person in my life was my husband, Harry Ross. He was 14 years older than I was, and he was more than just a husband. He was also a father figure, and he knew the world, and he knew business, and he knew where he was going. And that kind of security is just irreplaceable. You have three wonderful children. You have grandchildren. Do, how, how would you describe yourself as a mother and how important family is to you? I loved raising the children and being a part of their lives. I loved being room mother. I loved doing all the things that mothers did in those days. Mothers didn't work. I loved it. But I realized <clears throat> if they were going to see the world, my husband would never leave his business long enough to take them on a trip. So one summer, I had a yellow station wagon, a Chevrolet station wagon, and we took off. I decided to show them the Texas I knew, and I drove all the way to Texas, and we had a wonderful time, and I drove back to California. I have three children who are not only my children, they're my best friends. Mm. And not only are they my best friends, but they are such moral human beings that I am in awe of them. Their hearts are so good. They're so charitable. But you know what the biggest thing of all is? They love one another. My children were raised as though cousins were the most important thing in their lives. And when they get together with their cousins, there is such family warmth. One of the most important things I've gotten from my mother is to be inclusive. Sometimes it's easy for families to break up into little groups and be exclusive and not include other people. And my mother reached out and included everyone. She, anyone who wanted to come to a holiday, anyone who wanted to be invited to a party, she would include everyone. Attitude is everything. Attitude will carry you through any part of life. No life is perfect. Trouble happens, it falls from the sky, and boom, there it is. You simply have to pick yourself up, solve the problem, brush yourself off, and start on your life again. My mom has always had that ability to, to just appreciate the smallest detail in, in, the, in the nuances of life. And there are certain people who are just born optimistic and, and born to um, suck out of life the, the, the joy of it. And, and she is one of those people. Tell me a little bit about your fears and how you manage them. I'll tell you in the beginning, I had a desperate fear of being poor, of not being able to provide for my children. I think that was a carryover from when I was a child and things were sort of rough through the depression and there was not a lot of any one thing. The fear of, of being without funds is a real fear. I think, I think I've overcome that somewhat by giving away a lot. I think what she's taught me is, is more by example. She's taught me to, to go for it, to not be afraid, to be adventurous, to try new things, to be bold. She would be the first to get on the back of my motorcycle if I was riding a motorcycle. She'd be the first to get in my airplane if I was flying an airplane. We were never taught fear. It was never part of the vocabulary of our family. Religion is not important at all. Ethics are important. If we all share the same ethics, it doesn't matter what religion is. The most important thing I have to give my children are the ethics that I live by and that I expect them to live by. And those are the things I want them to have. Iron and concrete and unchanging. Styles change and fashions change and Attitudes toward raising children change, and the government changes, but ethics remain the same. 
got to be true to yourself. A favorite story is when I was 10 years old and you stopped at a pay phone to make a phone call. And you put the dime in, you made the phone call, and after the, you hung up, the dime came back. And I picked up the dime and said, Mom, Mom, we got this back. And you took that dime from me and said, it doesn't belong to me. And you picked up the phone and you called the operator. And I could only hear one end of the conversation, <laughs> but you said, I made a call and this dime came back to me. It's not mine. I won the Texas State Declaration Contest saying, if by Rudyard Kipling. If you can keep your head when all about you are losing theirs than blaming it on you, if you can trust yourself when all men doubt you, but make allowance for their doubting too, if you can wait and not be tired by waiting or being lied about, don't deal in lies. I'd like to be 35 years old again, between 35 and 40. I was young and active and still cute enough to really enjoy life. And yet I was mature enough to know how to count my blessings. For a long time I was a golfer and that occupied a lot of my time and I won a number of trophies in golf and the kids used to be so proud when I came home with a trophy. Harry died and for a year, for two years, I really didn't uh, go out much. And then after a while, I started dating. The first t thing I told everybody, if you're looking for a wife, don't look here. I'm not about to get married. But Seymour came along, and somehow the other men dwindled away, and Seymour was it. He is a gentle, kind, wonderful man. He's the best friend I ever had. He is just so good. You know the Jewish expression, good to neshama? He's such a good soul. I had asked her on the first date, I said, what's a pretty lady like you doing not married? Because I think her husband had been dead for, I think, three years. And that's when she told me the rules. We've often thought the only thing that would ever uh, interfere with our, our relationship to each other is getting married. She's probably the most generous person I know there is, it goes right down to uh, if there's one thing left in the refrigerator and uh, I say, uh, there's something here that I know you like, you better eat it. And she says, no, we don't save anything in this house. And she can take the last bite of something that I know she likes and offer it to me. How would you like to be remembered? I would like to be remembered as a little bit of fun in somebody's life. I would like to be remembered more as a comedian than as a disciplinarian. I'm hoping the kids will remember every dumb, funny thing I might have ever said. And I've said some really kooky things. She walks into a room and the room lights up. Everyone knows her, everyone wants to greet her, everyone wants to sit at her table. She lives life to the fullest, so she really is that kind of anti-main character. And I think she likes being that anti-main character. It is her personality. How would you describe yourself? Well, I like who I am. I am mature and I have attained a certain patina and wisdom. But I'm young and eager for more. I like all the experiences I've had in life. I'm awaiting more. I still attack life to embrace both life with both hands. Live! That's the message! Live! Yes! Life is a banquet and most poor suckers are starving to death now. Come on, Agnes! Live! Live! Come, child! Live!